let's see. This one looks good. So we got spongy, a little bit of spongiosis right here. So spongiotic dermatitis. Looks like it's been going on a little while because we got some hypergranulosis. So it's starting to kind of like canify. The epidermis is getting thickened and acanthotic. That acanthotic epidermis and hypergranulosis are both signs of kind of chronicity. Look, we also got a, a folliculitis. We got a pustule down in the follicle. You can still see the hair shaft right there, a little tiny hair shaft. And the one thing I notice here is look at how dense pink the stratum corneum is. So maybe that's just due to like kind of scratching or like canification. But one thing you want to think of when you see a real dense, compact orthokeratin is I think of fungal organisms like dermatophytosis. And also if you're like in the axilla or the anogenital region, you can also think of erythrasma, which is caused by Carinibacterium minuticimum. And both of those tend to produce a really dense corneal layer. And in this case, it's fungus. And oftentimes on dermatophyte fungus, tinea, you often, I often struggle to see the fungus even when they're abundant. They're usually clear. But in this case, they do have a little bit of a kind of purplish color to them. And you can see the little holes they leave in the tissue. But I got to look around for a while. So notice that's another thing about fungus. When you're looking for fungus, whether it's on H&E or on uh, PAS or GMS stain, look carefully because I've almost overlooked it before. It's not always florid. It's sometimes very focal, even in a patient that has a pretty extensive, you know, um, overgrowth of fungus clinically, uh, it can sometimes be pretty focal on the slide. That's also a reason too that just because a biopsy was done and was negative for fungus or a KOH was negative for fungus, don't totally exclude uh, the possibility of tinea or other fungal infection from your differential clinically. If the process still persists after steroid treatment or what other, uh, whatever treatment you're using, keep in mind if you think it could look like fungus, then maybe try a trial of antifungals or consider doing a repeat biopsy or repeat scrape because I've seen times where it was very focal. Same goes for nail clippings. I've seen times where you have this big, thick, abnormal nail that looks like onychomycosis clinically and a large sample comes out and the fungus is only focally on the clipping. And I thought, man, if I had a smaller clipping, I would have called it negative. It's only because I got a big enough clip that I happened to get the area that had fungus. Now, plenty of nails are loaded with fungus, just like plenty of cases of tinea have lots of fungus, but there are times where it's focal. So just keep that in mind that it's not, it's not perfect. You know, um, KOH or a skin biopsy can sometimes miss those things. Um, even if the pathologist is not missing it, I mean, they just may not be showing up on the sections. And look here, this is another feature to remember too, that when you're thinking about dermatophytes, check in the hair follicles, because sometimes you have dermatophytes stent extending down the hair follicles. You can see it right here, and it's kind of got a purplish stain. Normally, again, dermatophytes are clear on H&E, and you know, like Malassezia or Pitrosporum, and also Candida are almost always bluish purple like this. But every once in a while, and I don't know why it is, every once in a while I'll see dermatophytes actually show up and be visible as a purplish blue on H&E. But most of the time in, in my lab, at least in my experience, they usually are clear. But you can see them here. Look, there's one, there's one, here's one, there's one, a little bit up here. So, and when in some cases they can go down and just involve the hair shaft in which we call, you know, particularly like in tinea capitis on the scalp, and we call that either endothrix or ectothrix pattern of, of infection. And in those cases, you may not have any on the surface. So don't forget to check the hair follicles. And sometimes, there, look, there's like no inflammation. This follicle has spongiosis, but no inflammation. All right, so there's the fungus in the follicle. Now look over here. We see another follicle, but this one is filled and distended with neutrophils, and it's got some inflammation in the dermis around it. All right, so this is a, a pustular folliculitis or separative folliculitis. Now, normally when we see this, it's often associated with coccyx bacteria, but in this case where there's dermatophyte fungus present, probably this indicates that there's more of that fungus growing down into the hair follicle with associated folliculitis, so kind of a fungal um, uh, folliculitis associated with dermatophyte. 
and I don't see any of the hythe in here, but that's probably what's going on. And so I actually pulled a couple extra slides from this case, other sections to see if we could see it more clearly. Here's another view of that same follicle. And look at the difference, just a slightly different uh, section, just a little bit deeper into the block, and you've got the pustule again in the follicle, and jackpot. We can actually see the fungus right there. So again, the, you know, the sampling and the sectioning uh, can really make a difference, and especially this is a case that's really pretty loaded with fungus. Sometimes the fungal organisms are much more sparse than this. So there's, there's a dermatophyte fungus extending down a hair follicle, and so when we see this, this, this kind of finding often goes hand in hand with what is called Miyake's granuloma, M-A-J-O-C-C-H-I, Miyake granuloma. So these, you know, lesions look more kind of indurated and firm plaques clinically and have a granulomatous appearance. And what I was always taught and what the books say is that Miyake's granuloma is supposed to be dermatophyte fungus causing a folliculitis, and then the folliculitis ruptures and the fungus and the inflammation spills out into the dermis. But I'll tell you that in practice, I have, I have almost never actually seen the fungus out in the dermis around the follicle. Almost always when I see lesions that clinically fit for Miyake's granuloma, microscopically what I see is just dermatophyte with folliculitis, and then there's perifollicular inflammation of varying amounts but I don't actually identify the fungus in the dermis. So even though the, the books say, at least what I've read, say that the fungus should be spilled out of the follicle into the dermis, I feel like in practice I almost never encounter that. And instead, if I just see fungal folliculitis like this with dermatophyte um, hyphae down in the follicle, to me that's enough to fit with what, what clinically is called Miyake's granuloma. So anyway, you can, you can do some more reading about that if you like, but that's been my experience at least. Let's look at another, uh, another section on here, because this is a pretty nice example. And here's a different follicle out towards the edge of the shave biopsy. And what do we see? The same thing going on. We see the fungal hyphae up here in the stratum corneum. Look at again how compact that orthokeratin is. I find that real dense pink orthokeratin right away, I think, of dermatophyte. And then we see these fungi going down this opening this infundibulum of a hair follicle with associated neutrophils. And again, the neutrophils kind of spill through the, the follicle and outside, but the fungus in this case, again, is confined to the follicle, at least in the sections that, that I've uh, looked at. And here's another follicle with a little bit more of the same, some fungi here. And so, um, I, if I recall correctly, Miyake's granuloma is often on like the, the anterior legs is where you tend to see this for some reason. The other place where you can see dermatophyte causing a folliculitis involving the hair follicle is in the scalp in the setting of tinea capitis. Um, and we don't often see that biopsy, but when you do, um, you'll see, you know, numerous follicles just completely loaded with fungus, either in the hair shaft or surrounding the hair shaft or a combination of those, and then a brisk inflammatory response with it. And so you can see this same kind of pattern in, um, in, um, in tinea capitis, uh, tinea of the scalp. And I think there is another section over here, yeah, where you can see the same thing again that follicle we just looked at. And look now, as we cut deeper, it kind of opens up more. We see more of the inflammation in there and more of the dermatophyte fungal hyphae. So this is an, a nice case to demonstrate this concept. And also, it's a good reminder of just how much things can change from section to section and why we order deeper levels so often in dermatopathology, because oftentimes the deeper level really uh, saves the day and shows us the finding of interest. So tinea or dermatophytosis, and there, look, here's some more right in this piece. And you know, it's just a simple fungal infection, you know, ringworm, not, you know, not going to be fatal to the patient, but I've seen cases where dermatophyte got, wasn't thought of and wasn't biopsied or scraped and was treated with steroid for a long time, sometimes years, and I'm sure you've all seen this too, and then it leads to tinea incognito, which is basically very extensive and sometimes severe looking, you know, rash clinically that keeps getting worse no matter what steroids you put on it because you're basically knocking out the immune system and letting the fungus overgrow. And then those patients can, you know, it can be very disfiguring and also uncomfortable. And I've seen patients that unfortunately have had years of untreated dermatophyte or, or in, in, improperly treated because they were treated with steroids and never sampled. So if you're watching this and you happen to be a non-dermatologist or a new dermatologist 
in training, remember that, that if you get a rash that continues to get worse with steroids, check for fungus, please, or at least try an antifungal therapy because um, that, that's a significant problem. And I've seen some pretty bad cases of tinea that have really caused a lot of morbidity to the patient for a long time. So, so the, simple, the simple fungus, even though it's common and simple, still can be a real problem for people. Not everything that's bad is cancer. There are plenty of non-cancerous rashes or infections that can actually really, really dramatically cause quality of life and morbidity for patients, even if they're not uh, deadly. 